Now, um, when I arrived, I actually turned this onto aeroplane mode. Yeah. Did you do something rather similar? <coughs> um, we do um, actually stream these talks real time on um, online, and then we do a bit of a edit to clean up and put it up on our website. So if you're interested in some of the ones that you've missed already, you'll find them on YouTube. If you just go to YouTube and type in Cooper Hewitt and then Bill's or Bill's Design or Bill's Design Talks, you'll find them there. So the recent ones, Emily Oberman was last and Helen Walters before that, Robert Wong, and a tribute to Ava Zeisel at the beginning of this season. But we also had, um, we have up there last year's series of eight, so there's some choices of things to look at. And then coming up on the 24th of May, we have Scott Wilson, um, industrial designer from Chicago, uh, who's also become an entrepreneur uh, inventing this um, product which turns a, an iPod um, into a watch and it's been sold very successfully through the Apple stores. So he's a mixture of a designer and an entrepreneur. And then on the 14th of June, we have Walter Hood, who's coming in from San Francisco, the landscape architect. So a couple more really interesting ones. Um, we also have one on the 3rd of May, but we don't have a confirmation yet, so it's a secret. <laughs> but look on our, our website, you'll find out what it's going to be. But right now, I want to ask Annabelle Seldorf to join um, us and, and show you her things, and I'll rejoin her for a little conversation later. So please welcome Al Annabelle Seldorf. Very bright here, very dark over there. Um, hello. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, these sort of talks always make me a little bit nervous. So um, I prepared with notes, but we can't be too sure that uh, I can also read my notes. So I'll be going back and forth, and I hope I won't get too confused. Um, anyway, um, thank you very much for inviting me, Bill. I thought that it might be interesting uh, to introduce three different projects, though they in some way represent a little bit of, an, of a sort of journey uh, from the early days when um, I started the office, which you can see right there. This is our current office at Union Square. Um, I started as a sort of one-man band, I guess most people do, um, and little by little we became uh, a group of now 45. Um, I particularly want to mention my colleagues and partners, Sarah Lopergolo and Lisa Green, who's with us here tonight. Um, we do a lot of different work. Three projects, as I said, we'll show you tonight. Um, the first one that I want to show you is a project that uh, perhaps some of you have visited before, the Neue Galerie, the Museum of German and Austrian Art on 86th Street and 5th Avenue. We were commissioned with this project in 1997. And um, it was a very exciting moment for us because it started out uh, with being a sort of small gallery re renovation that eventually turned into a full-fledged renovation for modern day museum purposes, which included all of the things like uh, sophisticated climates and lighting, etc. And it was, at that moment, the very largest project I had ever done. And it was, in addition, interesting because there was nobody to advise us on how to do it, because it was a brand new museum in New York City. So <clears throat> while that filled us with pride, there was a great deal of trepidation with did we know how to do this? Anyway, um, in retrospect, I think we sort of su succeeded all right. And it certainly wasn't uh, a sole effort. There was a great team. Renee Price and Ronald Lauder were our great patrons. And, um, and so we embarked on this, on this renovation of a remarkable historical building. It was built 1914 by Carrera and Hastings. Um, and was built initially as a residential, as, as a private villa. 
um, and was inhabited up until I think sometime like 1954 uh, by various families, the Miller family who built it and later on the Vanderbilts. In 1954, the Evo Institute acquired the building and um, hosted both lectures in it, but they also used it for document storage, which is why they didn't particularly care about any of the historical details. And um, while the building is 23,000 square feet, <clears throat> the actual exhibition space is really much smaller. It's only 4,500 square feet. You can see in that section that there is a sort of hole in the middle of the building um, which served as a light shaft. Um, and we uh, basically unearthed a covered skylight above it and made it a kind of balcony courtyard on the, in, on the administration floor and the fourth floor. So um, just to explain the floor plans a little bit, um, the program called for uh, a reception, ticket area, a bookstore, a cafe, um, a design shop, a coat room, et cetera, et cetera. And relatively speaking, the, the layout of the building had to remain more or less what it was, except there was a variety of adjustments. We had to make sure that we could accommodate the handicapped, uh, which meant that we had to introduce a small ramp on the outside, but also a little lift uh, in the entrance that would bring people to the elevated ground floor level, um, from where we then introduced a new elevator. So all of these adjustments in some way meant that there was interference with the original fabric of the building. And of course, we started out being very respectful of the, of the building's architecture by um, the famous Carrera and Hastings architect, you would know the public library, the Frick, um, and many other buildings. But, and there were remarkable details, beautiful paneling, uh, wonderful cornices, arches, marble floors, uh, that beautiful railing that you see in the, in the uh, picture behind uh, on the screen. Um, it wasn't always as coherent as one might think. Uh, we found that there were arches of different proportions, and all of a sudden, we were faced with something that I always think is very interesting. It's not just a straight restoration. It's not just a straight renovation either, because you, you have to start thinking critically about the historical material. Not everything that you find is good, um, or not everything makes sense in the new contact, context. So now when I go to the Neue Galerie, I'm actually quite pleased that I can simply look at the exhibitions and don't have to think anymore about like, does this belong in this category or in that category? Is it broken and we have to rebuild it? And are we going to rebuild it in exactly the same manner as uh, we found it? Or is there reason to do it in a different way? And I think the, the ultimately what was interesting was that it felt like it was absolutely meant to be there. For example, when you are at the coat room downstairs, you sort of enter through an arch, and that arch is new. Um, but it made perfect sense because it was symmetrical to the arch that leads into the bookstore. Whereas before, there had been, somebody had put in an elevator in the probably early 20s or so. And so, you know, there are a myriad of stories. And for the first couple of years, I sh for a long time, really, every time I went around, I was like, sort of, oh, no, that doesn't, not so good. And now I can sort of see it as a whole project, and I'm sort of very pleased that, uh, that there is that distinction. There is certain new things, like the elevator that we ultimately put in the, in the building, um, which goes through all of the floor from the basement all the way to the top floor, and that was sized to not only accommodate handicapped people, but also to bring up uh, art, you know, crates, cases, etc. Um, the bookstore was 
the former library and we used all of the cabinets. Some of them had to be rebuilt, some of them had to be sort of modified, and we inserted a central um, sort of reception element. Uh, and nowadays, I think it is one of the more success successful specialized bookstores. And I love to see how the sort of rather modern insertion of the furniture that we designed kind of ages along with everything else. And for us, it was always important that there was a little bit of a juxtaposition of something that's clearly modern, that is sort of very uh, definitively designed, and um, as opposed to the sort of older um, woodwork that's much more ornate and that's much more elaborate, if you will. The cafe, on the other hand, was perhaps uh, one of the more pleasurable rooms to design because it involved many trips to Vienna and, uh, and many p slices of cake in the various cafe houses. Um, and I'm only half kidding about that. That really was a wonderful experience to sort of go with the curators and learn about Vienna, learn about the culture. I myself am German and we know nothing about cakes. But the, the, the really marvelous thing was that we had an opportunity to go measure every banquette in every cafe house and sort of see like, do you sit upright? Do you want to sort of sit like this? And then eventually um, make, the, make the seating fit the room. We had actually an Otto Wagner fabric reprinted, which uh, we did with a company that's called Buckhausen. Um, and they offered to open their archives to make these special reprints. It was really a very, very special thing because not only was, did we deal with this wonderful old building, but we had, in addition, um, the support from the curators, the director, obviously, Ronald Lauder, who uh, was generous with his knowledge and his time and um, with the idea that he could offer this to the public. So there it is. There is a picture of the elevator that I mentioned earlier. That was this one very modern element we put into the building as a sort of architectural element, simply because you couldn't pretend that this was a 1910 elevator. It wouldn't have made sense. There was only one location where it could be. So we opted to say, this is clear and distinct from everything else, and, and there it is. Um, Lighting, air conditioning in these exhibition spaces was extremely difficult without touching uh, the substance. And this is one of the main rooms that undoubtedly you know if you have gone to visit Adele Bloch Bauer, uh, the famous Klimt painting. Um, it's, this room was called the music room at one time, and there where there are paintings now used to be uh, wood panels with mirror inserts because it was called the music room. And the mirror was not only sort of uh, a visual effect, but in addition it had a, an acoustic effect. So we took all of that away. And in the first round, we thought that we would have uh, freestanding partitions to accommodate as many paintings as possible, this being one of the main exhibition spaces. But then later on we recognized, and when I say we, I really mean uh, that it was a collaborative effort between everybody who was involved, Brene Price, the director, Ronald Lauder, um, the president, and, um, and the various curators who, who are still working with the, with the Neue Galerie. And we all decided that the marble framework that, uh, that a, accompanies the, the, um, the original mirrored panels was so beautiful and the stone was so nice that it had to be maintained. And today, when you look at these Klimt and other paintings, Schiele, um, et cetera, paintings that hang in this room, you think it couldn't have been any other way. It is absolutely wonderful that way. And I think it's testimony to the original architecture being just fantastically proportioned and sort of wonderfully balanced. In the paneled room, which at one time must have been one of the main living rooms, um, we installed uh, vitrines that come from the Victoria and Albert Museum. 
again, we played around endlessly with like what kind of vitrine would be the best vitrine. I very definitely wanted a modern vitrine. There were some 1930s vitrines designed by Josef Hoffmann that we looked at that were very beautiful. We went back and forth, and in the end, it seemed that these that we saw at the Victoria and Albert Museum were actually very beautiful. They're very versatile. They made a contrast uh, to, to the wood paneling, and I still think they fit perfectly. I didn't have any design to do. I just had to sort of draw the rectangles in the plan. Um, on the other hand, the top floor, the top exhibition floor, which is the third floor, and it is the floor that's dedicated to changing exhibitions. Uh, there was absolutely no detail left. It had been the floor where uh, documents were housed, and they just had stacked empty boxes of archival material in these, on these floors. So we were able to rebuild it completely. And on one hand, uh, we wanted there to be spaces, they were as nicely proportioned as the ones below, um, but being that this was the bedroom floor in the former residential layout, um, we essentially created three large rooms with a connecting hallway and had a little bit of liberty in making a sort of slightly more modern design. Having said that, however, you've probably all seen the different exhibitions that the Neue Galerie hosts, and you've seen many different iterations of it. I never fail to be amazed how different that floor can look. So um, that is what it looks like today, and, um, and it was a very wonderful experience, and one which uh, supported many more art projects and the next one that I'll want to show you is a project for David Swerner, who um, is an art dealer, a uh, German of origin. He actually grew up in the same town. And so we go way back, we're old friends, and uh, have worked together on many, many projects, notably his first gallery, his second gallery, his third gallery. <laughs> and. Um, here you see the gallery that we have uh, designed for him in an existing building, in an existing garage building in Chelsea. And um, essentially, there were three uh, galleries. He took one space, and then he said, you know what? I've added the space to the right. I've added the space to the left. All of them uh, are, I think, quite interesting because they feature a very very remarkable scale. Um, and in all of them, we inserted daylights, uh, I mean skylights, uh, to afford daylighting for, for contemporary art. And the subject that I really enjoy working on in these gallery type or exhibition spaces, art spaces, is the interplay of proportion of space and light um, and how one informs the other. So um, having had this collaborative relationship between David and, and Seldorf Architects, he embarked on a much larger project, which is under construction right now, on 20th Street between 10th and 11th Avenue. And, um, is a project that is very dear to us because it's big. Actually, that's not the only reason why it's dear to us. It's dear to us also because it's uh, we're attempting gold lead status, meaning it's one of the first buildings uh, dedicated to an art gallery that really attempts to sort of have as many sustainable features uh, as we can possibly afford. Those features are uh, mostly, I mean, there are ma many different aspects to it. There is a green roof, there's daylighting. Daylighting is a very, very important thing. It's obviously very important for an art space, but it's a well-insulated art space that at the same time daylights and uh, in the upper floors, the offices, um, we have natural ventilation. This particular building features a very large 
48 by 45 foot column free space um, that has these four sawtooth skylights and uh, is a pretty remarkable 18 foot tall exhibition space. Um, along the street there is a, a welcoming opening, open shop front. There'll be some greenery uh, that grows up the building and um, use of local wood windows. And that's again one of the features that obviously uh, contributes to having sustainable quality is to sort of use local materials to the extent possible. And um, right, there it is. We're sending people up the stairs, uh, meaning the more you encourage people to walk the stairs, mm -hmm. the more points you get from lead. So <clears throat> I can't wait to send people up the next 20 story building. <laughs> well, just kidding. Um, did I forget anything? I think um, the thing, well, here you see an image of the, of the, the main gallery space with the large skylights. I think it's going to be a really beautiful thing. Um, the facade, oh, there you see it's under construction now. There's the steel for those skylights. Um, it's really happening. The facade is of uh, cast in place board form concrete. And uh, that too is a little bit unusual. Um, again, there was a lot of local expertise that we, that we uh, required. It's very difficult to do concrete work in New York. We had no experience with it up until now. Um, and that was a wonderful learning experience for us. And I think it'll make for a very strong and uh, monolithic facade, which sort of suits the, suits the subject very well, I think. So now, <laughs> the project that um, I will really need my notes for, um, that is perhaps one of the dearest projects we are working on right now, um, is Sunset Park Materials Recycling Facility in Brooklyn. Perhaps you've heard of it. Uh, it's remarkable for a variety of reasons. And then I'll read a couple of notes before I sort of dive into the, into the slides. <coughs> Um, this facility is a processing center for New York City's recyclables, and it's a public-private partnership between SIMS Municipal Recycling and the City of New York. SIMS uh, is a division of SIMS Metal Management, a multinational company that has been in the business of recycling for over 30 years and uh, is, is probably one of the largest companies of this kind in, in the world. They have won the city's contract to handle the recycling of metal, plastic, and glass as we negotiated the planning for this, for this recycling facility. Many agencies of the city were involved. Mm -hmm. uh, the Department of Sanitation, the Economic Development Corporation, the Department of Environmental Protection, and ultimately, uh, <coughs> as this is very much in the focus of the mayor's efforts to revitalize the waterfront of Brooklyn, uh, it was subject to the Public Design Commission, which eventually um, gave us a prize for design excellence. I thought it was very remarkable that they gave us a prize uh, before the building was built. I hope they won't renege on it later on. <laughs> It's located on a very prominent site, however, where you see the little green uh, circle, uh, on a waterfront site in Sunset Park in Brooklyn. It was called the former Bush Navy Terminal. And it really is conceived to be a recycling uh, sort of showcase, uh, dovetailing with the growing public awareness for sustainability and, and an interest that uh, has, is theretofore unknown. Everybody's looking at what is happening at the waterfront and in this neighbor in particular, uh, neighborhood in particular, a lot of things are going on. So 
yeah, this is one of my favorite uh, pictures showing those uh, early 20th century buildings that that go along the waterfront with those wonderful classic water towers. Unfortunately, since then, they have been removed and it looks like they're not replacing those water towers. Um, yeah, so Sunset Park is undergoing a vibrant revitalization and probably recently you have read in the paper that very nearby there is one of the largest urban agricultural farms going up on the roof of one of those uh, large buildings. The site is, comp is on a pier. Uh, it's about 11 acres, comprises 11 acres, and it's facing the Goannes Canal, as I said already, um, with spectacular views of Lower Manhattan and uh, Red Hook. The facility is intended to do something that really is, is quite revolutionary. It'll minimize truck traffic through a prim primary reliance on barge and rail. And uh, that is a strategy that will eliminate 250,000 mi miles of annual vehicle traffic from city roadways. That's pretty remarkable. Um, so here you see the overall plan of the facility. Um, and we worked closely uh, with the team at SIMS to devise a master plan that, you know, first and foremost is informed by the location of the, of the functions of the main buildings, the tipping building, uh, the processing building, and the bale storage building, which you see on the, uh, along the water's edge on the southern side of the, of the drawing. Um, one of the great efforts consisted in devising ways to separate all the, the different kinds of circulation. The incoming trucks and, and trains uh, had to be separated from visitors, school buses, uh, people who work in the buildings. And at the same time, we wanted there to be a clear logic, a clear understanding, and an opportunity for views toward, like I said, Manhattan and Red Hook. Um, and we wanted there to be as much greenery as possible. Um, it's not just this diagram that where the green jumps into your eye more prominently, but actually uh, there is a lot of green space, some 30% of it, and it is devoted not only to plants, there's a dense uh, fence along the, what is it, the eastern edge of the site. Um, but there is also open green space that contains bioswales for water storage, I mean, water retention. So maybe go to the next. Um, there you see the, the, the overall building is 125,000 square feet, and it's comprised of several structures. I mentioned that earlier, the tipping building, where materials are offloaded, both from barges that come in, from trucks or from rail cars, and um, then the processing building, which you sort of see on the other side. Here you're looking at the tipping building on the right left-hand side of the, of the slide, the sort of tall space, which contains, uh, needs to be tall because there are cranes and materials uh, are being being moved around, and on the right-hand side uh, is the processing building where materials are sorted and eventually packaged. From the water here, you see uh, the big, tall, tipping building, um, and to the other, on the left-hand side, the administration and visitor center. Um, it was very important to the client and continues to be very important to the client that uh, we that this facility be also used for education. So on the lower floor there are offices, but the second floor is dedicated to exhibition for children of all ages who come in and are taught about uh, about recycling. They can go across a bridge and actually on a viewing corridor inside the tipping building, uh, 
learn firsthand about what recycling looks like. And um, we're all very excited that this is, is something that is becoming such a public um, opportunity. Um, all of these elements, of course, are very much dedicated to their functionality. Um, there was a great effort made by, by a, a big team of people to not only create visually appealing relationships, and I was in charge of that, but also uh, make the building efficient, sustainable. The, the um, construction of the buildings they're all pre-engineered buildings. Uh, you're probably, you have seen in suburban places many of the big box buildings. But um, the reason why we employed this kind of construction technique is because it allowed us to have column-free space, which was able to be erected very quickly. Um, it's actually remarkable to, to watch the erection of this building, sort of, you can literally stand there and watch them lift up these enormous pieces of steel. But um, for, for everybody, it was very important that, uh, these, that the steel elements of these pre-engineered buildings are 100% recycled. And the company that does this work is a company in Indiana, they're called Nucor. And we went to visit their facility, and it is really a fascinating uh, thing to see this sort of made all in America, where the steel gets melted, then they shape the the steel um, beams and columns, and eventually ship them to the site where they are numbered, and then they get erected one, two, three, by a team of professionals, and um, that was really a wonderful learning experience for us to see that there is a sort of architectural identity that can be created by using a technology that is otherwise, um, I guess you could call it anonymous. What we did is we decided, at least in the tipping building, to expose the structure uh, make it visible on the outside for both architectural prominence, but also to sort of be indicative of what was going on on the inside of the building. And um, <laughs> you see that big hole there? <laughs> That's where the tipping building is going to go. It's not yet up. But just wait a little while and then I hope that you'll come and visit. Um, one other aspect that uh, we're very excited about is that we're going to have probably the largest assembly of solar panels on the roof of that large building. And, um, and another aspect is the wind turbine, which is on the sort of northwestern edge of the site that's going to go up, and it's probably New York City's first wind turbine. Um, it'll generate about 25% of the building's electrical consumption, which is pretty significant if you imagine the kind of equipment that's inside a building like that. Um, so I think uh, it's also important to say that when you build on a pier like that, um, there's solid fill that has to go in. And Sims was able to generate their own recycled material and use glass that they produce in a different facility in New Jersey um, as infill material in addition to the um, asphalt paving that was there before that has, you know, was, was reused, so to speak, along um, with mole rock from, from the Second Avenue subway. So, a funny thing. Um, there will be a stormwater tank that collects rainwater to irrigate all that green space and um, all sorts of other sustainable and energy efficient uh, things like energy efficient lighting, automated uh, switching, occupancy sensors, skylights for daylight, uh, all of the strategies that uh, we know to use to make for a more agreeable and more sustainable um, building and, and uh, overall use. Um, 
hoping that we can raise awareness with this building um, for greater and better use. And um, we're hoping that people will, will come and look at that. And there it is. Thank you. I stuttered too much, I'm sorry. Um, you know, coming back to the Neue Gallery for a moment, I mean, one of the things I love about that is the um, relationship between that filigree staircase, which has got this sort of railing, which is so delicate, and then the fact you put this completely solid black reception desk. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's you like it. <laughs> wonderful contrast. And it went so beautifully with the marble floor too. I agree. All right. <laughs> um, think, thinking more about the cafe, though, because the cafe is such a delight. Um, you know that uh, we call those rich cakes Danish pastries, but in Denmark they call them Viennese bread. Oh, um, that's right, yes. So um, I think perhaps the, uh, the arrival at Vienna is an important element of that design. On the other hand, one's been in cafes all over Northern Europe, you know, and it could be in any part of Germany or perhaps Scandinavia. And it has that sort of European quintessence of this is a European cafe. And you managed to achieve that in, when you go into that um, cafe in the Neue Gallery, you really feel you're in a little corner of Europe. And I just wondered if you could comment on how, what those qualities are. What is it that makes it feel like a, a European cafe as opposed to something that's more local? Well, I actually think that probably first and foremost, it's scale. Um, I think that the way the chairs and the tables are sized, um, th I, th I think that's a, that's a very important thing. But it's more than anything a number of, of aspects. It's the banquettes that are not too big. It's um, a dedication to sort of showing the food. I think there is a carefulness about the place. And it's not just a matter of design. It's a matter of the design that comes together with the quality of the food and the way in which it is presented and, and served. For example, you'll have those tiny little oval trays, and if you order a cafe, you'll get it with a glass of water. And there is a sort of extra care. Yeah. And all of it goes together. I think it's not as large, it's not as fast, it's time, I think, is a very big <laughs> effort, uh, aspect in all of this. Well, if you haven't been there, I highly recommend it you take the time and enjoy it over a slow, long lunch um, without the necessity to dash back to your everyday life. That's a wonderful yeah, it thing. Does, it does make you feel like you want to stay a while, right? I know many people who say that they go there for breakfast. <laughs> Just go read the paper and sit there by yourself. Yes. Um, whenever I go, there is, seems to be a long line and you can't get a seat, but... But you can. <laughs> I, was, I wasn't going to brag. <laughs> Actually, it's, you know, the whole Neue Gallery, it's fascinating to hear that it's 15 years old because it feels so similar to us at the Cooper Hewitt in that we're just in the middle of this um, renovation and taking the mansion and expanding the gallery spaces um, and doing something that um, is going to have rather similar challenges, I think, to the ones that you described for the design of the whole building. Um, and we're f fascinated to see the result of that, although we still have a couple of years to wait before the galleries are actually open again. But we're already in the um, townhouses, and one of the things that's good about that, if you're looking for green um, exercise for your, your gold um, stature, is um, if you have a very slow elevator, we find that we have a very slow elevator, so people tend to walk up and down the stairs just because they can't be bothered to wait. So that's the opposite of the slowness of the, the cafe, but yeah, that's it works. Right. It works. <laughs> I believe that. On the Sunset Park, though, I mean, that's such a huge and magnificent systemic kind of solution, and 
You know, when one thinks about everything sustainable, um, particularly in Northern Europe, um, Germany and Austria and Scandinavia seem so far ahead of, um, of habits that people have in terms of um, bottle recycling and, and the, the, the idea that it's a normal thing. It seems to have been there for 20 or 30 years, whereas here it seems relatively fresh. Um, but could you tell us a little bit more about the level of systems rather at that sort of scale, like Sunset Park? Are, are there a lot of those in Europe as well? Or is it more unique? Um, well, I think it's it's probably the biggest of its kind in America. Um, there, there may be facilities that are, if not equal, probably close to that in scale. But it's very interesting that I think a lot of what uh, what is remarkable about this facility for for me is obviously for personal reasons, it's the sort of learning about recycling, learning about sustainability, um, changing uh, the, public, the public's awareness, um, but also sort of changing New York City in that way. You know, there are greater efficiencies than just meet the eye and making this something that uh, New Yorkers can be proud of, both for hopefully architectural reasons, but also because of how the whole thing works. You'll be interested to know that a great deal of the technology that's going into the building actually comes from Holland. And, um, and there are more and more companies, as you mentioned, in, in Europe there is a sort of dedication to recycling that goes back uh, quite a ways, but I think that what Sims is introducing here is really probably just the beginning, and hopefully they'll be doing many more projects, bigger projects, and hopefully they'll always ask me. Um, no, but uh, joking aside, I think that uh, that this really is the beginning of it, and um, and we will see more and more of these kinds of facilities because that's what we need to do. So your office is actually even, you know, 24 years old now. I mean, what are you going to do to celebrate your 25 years? <clears throat> I'll take a holiday, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's it's terrible. I uh, I've been in America for a long time, and I have uh, gotten used to now saying I'm here for more than 20 years. Um, and sorry, I, sorry that's, to that's right, the exactly. <laughs> forget it. <laughs> So yeah, and you, you came from Cologne, Cologne. That's right. Which has one of the most beautiful cathedrals. I don't know whether you've been up the spires of the Cologne Cathedral. It was bombed very severely in the Second World War, and gradually has been restored. And it's just such a magical place. Well, it's actually interesting to say that the restoration of it is uh, very different from the kind of restoration I talked about at the Neue Galerie, because it is dedicated to completely uh, making things the way they were planned or the, the way they were once built. And there is an enormous shop, an enormous stone mason's shop, um, where people learn about uh, carving stone and sculpture. And um, it's quite famous because it, there are many people who work there and they will it will never end, I think, is really what one can say. So once they are done with this corner, they have to start at the other corner. And, and the, you have a line of furniture, which I gather was instigated by your grandmother. Yes, that's she, right. Was she a designer, or? Um, no, my grandmother or? was an opera singer. Oh, um, really? And um, I spare you, because in my free time, I try You're going to sing for us tonight? I, well, I could. <laughs> I'm not sure that you want that. But, um, yeah, my grandmother, at a time when, when sort of people were rebuilding, had the very good idea to start this business, which was not so much furniture initially, but was more sort of uh, interior design, and uh, it included furniture. And when I was a kid, we grew up with these furniture shops all around us, and um, that was rather fun because it made for a very good playground. But um, that company sort of closed and um, 
and changed a little bit. My father and, and his siblings took over the company and sort of turned it into more of an architecture business, an architecture and planning business. So when, um, when I started my own office in New York, we found ourselves doing small scale renovations and there was always the odd table missing and the this and the that. And um, I thought, well, I can design a table. Um, well, you know better than anybody how difficult design is. And while it's analogous to architecture, it really is a very different thing. And so we learned over many years how to do furniture and then we started to um, re-edit some of the work, not so much that my work of my grandmother, but many of the furniture pieces that my father designed in the 60s and But he was more 70s. of an architect, was he? I mean, no, he both, so. sort of came to architecture through furniture, furniture design and uh, through interior Of course, Cologne's very much a center for furniture in Germany, isn't it? I mean, yeah, it is. I, in fact, the reason I went there regularly in the 70s was for the Cologne Furniture Fair which was where everybody in Europe collected to see the latest yeah. furniture, both modern and traditional. Yeah. So, but he, but he was, he, you know, what did he think about you wanting to be an architect or not wanting to be an architect or being a rebellious teenager or leaving for America or something? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think that he thought I was kidding when I said I was going to America. Um, and neither he nor my mother were terribly concerned because they didn't think that I'd get into school anyway. Um, so I, I guess they weren't terribly pleased when I left, but... Um, you went to Pratt. I went to Pratt. Pratt that was pretty grim, grim at the, that yeah, time, wasn't that it? Yeah, it was grim. That's it's absolutely lovely. true. It's lovely now, mind you, but... <clears throat> but because my parents weren't so interested about where I would go, they sort of said, yeah, yeah, you're not going to get in anyway. It's just... Anyways, just to, uh, um, they didn't mind that I applied to only one school, and that was Pratt. And I obviously didn't apply because I thought it was grim. I thought it's the only school, school that'll take me in New York. And in fact, it turned out that way. <laughs> so, so were you happy with that experience? Was it something well, you got a lot out of? It's like so many experience that uh, so many experiences, since you didn't have another one, you might as well be happy with it. But after that, you went to <laughs> Syracuse, right? Uh, I, yeah, I didn't spend much time in Syracuse. I got my master's with Syracuse and uh, spent a year in Italy, which definitely is incomparable to anything. Right. And what triggered the first decision to make an office? I think I just wasn't a very good employee. Um, I, th I really did think that if I had my own office, I could work at night and sort of go to museums during the day. <laughs> <laughs> and it didn't last very long, obviously, that idea, but it was sort of what motivated it. And did you think of it as architecture or interiors, um, a mixture of the two, furniture? I mean, what was the sort of original ambition in your construct? No, I thought of it as architecture, um, but I was, sort of timid in some ways. I was very happy to do small projects at first because I had to like figure out how to do them. And if it had been too big, it would have been too big for me to figure it out. And so in a, in a way, I was actually quite pleased to first do somebody's kitchen and then somebody's kitchen and bathroom and then their kitchen, their bathroom and their living room mm -hmm. and um, gradually sort of grow into, into sort of larger scale. And do you think interior design is best done by people with architectural training or, I mean, there's a lot of separation between the disciplines where the people who just learn to be interior designers, you know, they don't, they don't do buildings, whereas architects often do interiors, right? Yeah, yeah, no, I definitely come from, from a tradition that thinks that architects know best. Um, <laughs> but, but on the other hand, my father who wasn't a trained architect in the first place. I remember that when when I deliberated what I wanted to do, um, he said, don't study interior design because study architecture instead because you can always do interior design as an architect, but you can't do it the other way around. And I think that is true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen pictures of the interior of your own apartment. 
that you, it's a fairly recent project, I believe, isn't it? I mean, I don't know quite how long, but very, very beautiful. She has this incredibly simple white surrounding, and then very eclectic pieces of furniture from Europe, from China, historical, very new as well. And then these beautiful marble floors, which I hear you like to pad around in your bare feet. <laughs> yeah, they're great, yeah. It's very, they're very nice floors. Oh, come on, tell us more. <laughs> Why, well, sometimes I roll around on the floor, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, that's what happens at night, then. Oh. All right. I hope with a martini or something. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, I, you know, the fact that you're president of the Architectural lead, League, um, I think is evidence that you have a very strong sort of intellectual influence on the architectural community here. And the interesting thing to me about the League is that it is interdisciplinary. It's not just architecture. That's right. There's people from different backgrounds, but it is relatively local. I mean, it's New York, isn't it? It's not national. No. It's it's uh, it's not national as a as the seat of the architectural league, of an organization that's been around for 130 years, is in New York City. But I think what makes it remarkable is their their dedication to excellence in design, architecture, and related uh, related uh, disciplines. For example, landscape design, graphic design, etc. And but. What they do is they bring in people from all over the world. And um, I am very much pleased and flattered, as you can imagine, to have been elected as the president of their board. But first and foremost, what's wonderful about it is that you learn so much. And if you're the president, you have to show up. So. Um, you because you I can't stay there on the marble floors with your martini. <laughs> you have to go and learn stuff. What can I say? <laughs> um, but yes, the interdisciplinary quality is one thing that's very interesting. But I think more than anything, it's a generally open mind uh, to to find excellence, and. Um, I hope that you'll come and join us at lectures, symposiums, panel discussions, exhibitions, etc. Well, actually, I had a more kind of uh, question that comes from us at Kubi Hewitt. And if we want to become more of a national resource to help design in a more general way, um, you know, the people mostly think of the design disciplines somewhat separately from architecture. You know, that you think of graphic design, industrial design, all those things as being in a group, and architecture has a little bit of separation perhaps just the scale difference. So my question really is about whether it's easy to think, as you know, as president, you're representing the architecture community, architectural community, as a discipline. What can we do to help? And what could, what could a national design resource do to help that community, do you think? Well, uh, it's a very interesting question, because I think that uh, in a museum, you exhibit things. People are used to looking at coffee pots and, I don't know, lampshades. Um, looking at architecture in a museum is much, much more difficult. Architecture exhibitions often involve looking at drawings, and people glaze over and sort of go like, well, whatever. Um, looking at photographs of architecture is never as good as looking at architecture. So therein lies a problem. There are, of course, architecture museums as well. So then design museums uh, resort to architects who designed coffee cups. <laughs> Super interesting. Well, quite a lot of them. Quite a lot. It's true. <laughs> <coughs> I myself designed one. No, uh -huh. I didn't. I never have. I never have. Um, Next. But exactly. Not to <laughs> self. Um, but um, involving the architectural community, I think, is a very interesting thing that could be done in a multitude of ways. Uh, it would help the architectural community to come up with sort of different concepts, whether they are uh, films, documentaries. Um, there is actually architecture and film, as you as you know, is is very sort of sympathetic to each other. First of all, you can see buildings in three dimensions, but also, I think, dialogue between uh, architects. Probably many of you have seen My Father the Architect, the film about Louis Kahn, which I think, for 
whether you like it or not, was a very, very moving film. And one learned about the passion about architecture and about the fact that there is more to architecture than meets the eye. But also, um, I think it's sort of more about the sort of human aspects of it. I don't know whether film is the only way, but there is, you know, an, any number of ways. But, but you have an opportunity to address a larger public. Um, people come to you who are not necessarily knowledgeable about architecture and to sort of expand um, everybody's horizon and offer the opportunity to learn about architecture, I think, is would be a marvelous way through panel discussions. Tell stories. And tell the stories, yeah. And some sort of narrative. Right. Or conversation. Yeah, well, that's really well, that's like encouraging. A it's a lovely thing to be asked to do. So I'm um, talking about conversation. Why don't we bring the microphones up and then people who are here could join in and ask some questions, make some comments. Um, if, you, you know, if you can just come to the front and use the microphone, and please say who you are um, so that our online audience can know that before you say anything else. Um, by the way, while well, we're waiting for somebody to come up, um, I saw this wonderful photograph of a, a little, couple of little cabins that you did in Canada. The thing that was striking about this photograph was that you couldn't see the cabins. <laughs> it was like in the mist. <laughs> you just got this little walkway that went up towards them, vanishing into the mist. I mean, is this standard for you to be so modest about your work that you hide it completely? <laughs> I had uh, to give a presentation at Landmarks, and I was criticized for being not bold enough. Um, yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Melinda Cosentino, and I noticed through your talk tonight, you used the word learn in every context as you were talking. So I was wondering, as you design the sunset space, um, what uh, particular elements uh, did you bring to play in the educational space that you'd like to um, talk about in detail? Thank you. Um, well, here we are talking about my modesty, et cetera, et cetera. I also have a mighty big ego. Um, so I think uh, <laughs> it starts with thinking, and it starts with uh, iterative process, with dialogue, with asking questions, and asking the right kinds of questions, and thinking about education with a degree of common sense, probably also a degree of infantility. Um, I mean, if you can imagine you, would, you were a kid, what would you want to see? Um, what would you want to learn? What are the questions that would rivet you to find out about? Um, it's actually that kind of thing uh, that then sort of generates the next level of answers and the next level of questions. And um, does that answer it? So please come to the mic. Um, I was hoping uh, to hear in a little bit more detail about some of the decisions that you made in the specific spaces uh, regarding that process. Um, well, in that particular case, we're working with an exhibition designer. Um, help me out what they're called. Whirlwind. I'm like can only think of my own name. Um, no, I'm sorry. Um, a wonderful exhibition designer, a company called Whirlwind. And um, there was a lot of dialogue about how they felt that children should be brought in, uh, what kind of content they would see. Um, and I should not take any credit of it. It's really all theirs. Um, though I will say that it was, again, it was a lot of dialogue and discussion that sort of led through bringing the architecture together with the ideas about the exhibition design. And I should have men mentioned them earlier, because they are really great contributors. Yeah, talking about the infantile, I think that's a nice way of expressing it. And I remember um, but I, in my IDEO days, there were some collaborations with Etri Sotsas. He was doing the design, and IDEO was doing the engineering. And uh, I remember him saying, um, before going into a client meeting, remember to ask the stupid questions. <laughs> I thought that was pretty good advice. So do we have somebody else? Yes. Yes. 
I wanted to ask you a question uh, that's very future-oriented, because I know architects can imagine things the rest of us can barely begin to see. Um, so my name is Carrie Dina Carmel. I wrote a book called Style Makers, and I'm very curious about whether your vision of the future um, involves more of an intersection between art, design, architecture, all those things. Um, well, I, I guess that I could say it would be my wish that there is more of an intersection of that. But I am optimistic in the sense that people become increasingly interested not only in design but also in architecture and uh, participate in, in the dialogue about those things. Um, it's, it's a really big topic, I think, because it seems to me that with all of the uh, opportunities to look at three-dimensional design, everybody feels more readily um, capable of saying this is how they want it. And it becomes increasingly gestural, which for me is not necessarily always the the be-all and end-all. I always wonder when you see those exuberant uh, uh, organic uh, shaped spaces, how they actually inform our everyday life since we still seem to be sleeping horizontally and... We're rectilinear. Right? I mean, I sort of imagine that if we could make those organic spaces really soft, everybody could lie down whenever they just feel like it. It's not like but a marble floor though, is it? <laughs> <laughs> That's why I have the marble floor. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's interesting, this sort of whole right brain, left brain thing that people are talking about a lot, about the mix between creativity and logical thinking. And obviously design's always been embracing both. Um, of course, everybody embraces both, a scientist does right. as well. Um, but uh, there's a more kind of equal split, possibly, in the creative disciplines. Um, but how that relates to whether people want to do art in the way that you were describing, or whether they want to think of themselves as problem solvers, and whether being an artist as well as a designer informs the design, or is it more of a it's kind a of relief? It's a question of which comes yeah. first, right? Yes. Yeah. What do you think? Um, I think that's different for everybody, and I admire and uh, am completely fascinated by people who sort of start without the, the, the purpose. Um, for me, condition and purpose is what sort of generates any kind of thinking. And uh, I understand that a great deal of what happens in contemporary architecture, and design for that matter, is, is inspired by sort of losing the boundaries and uh, taking more liberties and, and, um, and being less constrained by, by the Cartesian grid or any grid for that matter. I, on the other hand, still like the grid. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, I get my best ideas from sort of thinking, it's like, well, how would you use that? Is that too big or too small? Um, and I think too big or too small is informed by the human body. And, you know, how large a handrail is, is about like, is it nice in your hand? And, um, and the tactile experience of, of material and space uh, is a generator of inspiration. So, uh, but, I, but I readily admit that that's a very personal thing. An inch is a thumb, a foot is a foot, a pace is a yard, yeah. and so on. Yeah. Hello, I'm Kara McCarty, and um, I'm a huge fan of your um, recycling center, and I can't wait to see when it opens next fall. That makes two of us. <laughs> Um, but I'd love it if you could just say a little bit more about the commission itself, because it's so unusual to have a, um, a high-profile a high architect do such a, uh, such a commission. Usually recycling centers are sort of quick and dirty solutions. They're often hidden and, um, and designed by architects or contractors. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about the commission itself. Well, um, that's a, that's a multi-part answer. I think first and foremost, it has to be said that uh, Sims Metal Management is a, is a terrifically forward-thinking 
company. And uh, they were really, or are the drivers in, in, every, uh, in every way to sort of uh, push forward thinking about sustainability. Uh, they love their recycling. Um, and their pride in this project uh, was something that they wanted to see expressed in contemporary architecture. Among other, it also uh, is true that the mayor, in their in their effort to sort of revitalize the the waterfront, and by them by the mayor's office requiring this project to be subject to the public design commission, um, there was a particular ambition from the from the government side. Um, I don't know that I was that prominent an architect, but um, we were hired. The way those things always go, somebody suggested that we participate in an RFP, and there were, I know that there were a couple of other architects, and I think it was really just our enthusiasm and our sort of like, we really want to do this, um, that ultimately uh, convinced the client, and perhaps I think I want to think that it was some of the imagery that we used. The last picture that I showed you of the facility at night um, is this sort of resounding idea that it's a 24-hour place that is great, vibrant, and, and present, and a contribution to the city at all times. And working with a vocabulary that um, this is there are no marble floors in there. Um, but sort of using industrial materials and using the technology and the, the construction means that are available and affordable because, you know, that among other things is, is a very big issue when you're building a big facility like that is to sort of uh, entertain and, and respect budgets and learn to understand that, you know, if you wanted that quarter inch reveal that I am used to doing on somebody's, I don't know, library or so, uh, you can't afford that at a big scale because that's not how it's done. So um, again, there comes that word learning in again. It's like you sort of, it's, a, it's, it's switching gears, but it's not fundamentally a different kind of thinking. So just it, all it takes is a great politician, um, a great company, and a star architect. Right. <laughs> There's another last one. I sort of want to build off of um, the last question. I'm Katie Scal, and I had the pleasure of working in Annabelle's office a few years ago. Um, just wondering if you can speak a little bit to you know the three projects you mentioned or very different projects, but the clients are also very, very different. Um, you know, working with David Zwarner is, I can imagine, very different from working with multiple city agencies. So if you could just speak to how that influenced the design process. Um, well, I do have to admit that I don't work very closely with the uh, city agencies, that the client really Tom Outerbridge, who is in the audience, um, really bears the brunt of all of that. Um, and while we supported uh, submissions and and the process along the way, um, it, I think it is an interesting question in as much as when you're working on a public project like this, it is subject to so much scrutiny that it slows the process down. And um, that is at times frustrating and perhaps even a little bit frightening because you think like, well, how are you ever going to get something done? Um, it is so, so difficult to get things through all of the channels require to, to uh, live up to all of the permits. Though in general, it has to be said that, uh, that building of any kind is increasingly um, subject to hair raising bureaucracy. And, um, so yeah, there's that. Uh, working with the client actually astonishingly was the same. It's really always about dialogue. It's always about exchange. Our work, I think, is very much informed by really truly understanding and listening to, to what the practical requirements are and what the thinking behind um, 
those requirements is to really sort of critically think through program issues and and find uh, a creative way to to process those programmatic requirements um, yeah yeah I think it's very unfair to call you a stock tech because you know if you think about the the nature of the contribution that you've described this evening it's been so much about pr thinking and problem solving and learning and and considering everything in a way that's informed by the context at a very sort of deep level informed by the dialogue with the people you work with so it's that kind of quality that brings the success to your work I think and um, and the association people have with star is the sort of inspirational instant result and which is quite the opposite perhaps to your kind of practice so I'd like to thank you for making such a contribution to our whole society as well as this <laughs> evening thank you very much <laughs> That's